Okay, now can you hear me, Barry? Yeah, you just unmuted. Yeah. All right. Let's see what's going on today. Nice background, Barry. You're getting better and better at this. <laughs> I was playing with my old Canon camcorder that I converted from a camcorder to a webcam, but it's dying. The, uh, the top one third of it is beginning to get noisy lines in it that just are getting worse and worse. Deteriorating the stages of life. Yeah. You, you can't actually see it too bad here, but if I switch, if I get rid of the background, let's see, where is that at? Video settings. If I turn off the background, you can see how bad it is. Yeah, I see what you're saying. And even if I turn on the blur, but if I turn on that particular background, then you, it can, tends to hide the, uh, the the bad, noisy lines in the camera. As long as your head is not on top. Right. What I had to do is I had to aim it so that I'm below <laughs> the top of and, and then if I turn on the lights, let's see, where's the other effects? Um, background and effects. Yeah, the background take over the top third. And if you put your head above that, yeah. yeah. See, then I could turn on the lights at the top to uh, conceal the fact that I've, I'm have i not <laughs> up here where yeah. it's going to be, <laughs> yeah. where it's trying to key in my, my head where, the, where there's the bad video. But I was just proving that I can sort of salvage this, but not really. Uh, that camera is just basically dying. This is what I mean by fine tuning, you know, yeah. when you know the limitation of a system, you compensate for it or you somehow supplement it or whatever you want to call that. You make use of whatever you, is usable. You ignore the one that is not usable or you compensate for the one that is not usable and you, you got your perfectly working can't, webcam. Nobody tells. Nobody knows. Right. Um. I What I wanted to do, what I was playing with is that for example, Adobe has a premium feature called After Effects, to, which is used to clean up artifacts and noise and graininess in your video. And I was wondering if, besides the rather pricey Adobe After Effects, if there was a, um, a less expensive or a free version of um, something like it that would basically average out the the places where the lines were and try to get something that wasn't so bad. Unfortunately, none of the freebies seem to have a feature that will denoise a digital well, signal. Why, why do you want that? Because a lot of AI tools now, they can allow you to do that with ease, with, without, you know, just mouse click. That's all right. Let me give you the link. Okay, after the chat. That's What's the name the right of the here. thing you're telling me about? Okay, it's called futuretools.io. Click on it. Futuretools.io? Yeah, I gave that to you before. So it's a website of collection of all the AI tools. Mm -hmm. and, and it's some, click on it, tell me when you get the screen up. Let me bring up the... It's on the chat. Just click on the link. I'm gonna bring up the chat. Okay. Feature Tools collects and organizes all the best AI tools so you can become superhuman. Yeah, so, so what you're looking for is uh, clean up background, editing. All right. Is that the actual name of it, clean up background? Or I don't know. <laughs> some other thing? Jeez, there's yeah. tons of them here. Which one? <laughs> no, so on the top, you see how there's a little box of five rows of five? So you need to, you know, so for example, AI detection for fun, imaging, scanning, 
productivity, text to speech, aggregator, gaming. You see those words on the top after the heading. Future to collect, organize all the best AI tools so that you can do become a superhuman. Yeah, then below that, what? There's a ton of them listed. Yeah, so you have to click on what, what you want. So, so for example, you're looking for something that chairs, something that motion caption, something for sound improvement. I'm looking for the one that's for, we, uh, what do you call the picture editing, you know, clean up. Look, there's one called video editing down in the bottom. They're, they're alphabetical. So yeah. in the bottom of that collection, there's one called video editing, maybe? Is that the one you think it is? Yeah, I mean, again, it's picture editing, video editing is all the same thing to me, but it's just video, just a lot of frame. That's about it. So play with it. So this one will have the resource that, I mean, think of this way. This is the library, like remember the good old days, Yahoo? <laughs> manually put all the catalog for you together so you can find exactly what you're looking for in the good old Yahoo days, like a yellow pages. This is yellow pages of AI tool. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, so search editing noise out of camera video. We'll see if that tells me anything. When you click on editing, it will bring it down to 37 of 2,027 tools. So did you click on video editing? I did. Okay, so you now have show to, to 37. Now it says showing zero, so I got to get rid of my search. Yeah. <laughs> get rid of my search. Now it shows, now it shows 37, yeah. yeah. 20, so those are the 37 oh. of the one that, you know, filtering out only the one that for video editing. Here, the one the top right hand corner on the, you say we made a platform for image and video editing. See that? Um, I put in I put in another search term. I got to get rid no, of those. Yeah, get rid of those. Yeah. So if you only see that 37. Yeah, V make. I see the platform for image and video editing. This yeah. is post, this is post production editing though, right? Not real time. You know, it's post production. Again, it's a platform. It doesn't care. It's a you know post on prior or whatever you want to call that. So if you scroll down. To see there's any more image improvement. Improve improvement on a there's a fifth down the right hand side. One, two, two three, three, four, five. five. I'm boring, but boring AI. a platform editing. Yeah. So image, image improve. improvement. So you see, this is what I'm talking about. So you can see find it very easily. So again, it's the yellow pages for AI tools. If you go down about, I don't know, 10, you can see piece. P I C S piece art, picture art. Pen down. So one, two, three, four, five, six. If you see the big M, small, a small M with a red red thing, that's two down under there. I'm still scrolling down looking for it. A, a big M. A, a red M, a red M, a red yeah. M. If you see the red M on the right hand side, it's two down under the red M. Red big M. Red small big M. Not seeing a red M. Uh, so my my search is limited right now to nothing in the search box. And no, it's showing, it still says showing 20. 27, so I've got to go back. You do it this way, do it this way. It's much easier. Let me give you the better way. Control F. You are, oh, you sorry. You do do a search on this page, type in the word image. And there'll be one of six. You said this page. Where did you put this page? No, no, no. Okay. Let, I found I found it. Uncheck the video editing. Uncheck the video editing on the right. top. Oh, nothing's checked. So I have all 20, 2,000. Okay. So now click on the far right 
second line on the finance underneath there's a button that says oh, image improvement. Okay, I got yeah, that. that's what you image want. Image improvement gives me 77 now. Yep. So that's that's you have 772 right now for image improvement. But if you want to do video editing and image improvement, two checkbox, then you get about 1000, I mean 111. Well, now I have 111 video yeah. editing and image improvement. So again, and that's how you, you know, select whatever you want. So this one means it's an all, it's not an end. If you want to end, I teach you how to do the end. So you just do the video editing. So now you got 37 and now you do a control F. Control F. Do the image. I think it's on a Mac, it's option F. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The same thing, yeah. And you got one of seven, right? One of six. Um, what? Well, yeah, I get. Yes, there are six. Six that have the word image. Yeah, the first two doesn't count because it's the top, right? right? But the last four is have. Imp you can see this highlighted in yellow color for my screen. They will see the image improvement, so you can see what are the four image improvement AI tools that is also is a combination of video editing as well. So there's VMake. Yep. There's next one uh, you have uh I'm boring. I'm boring. Yep, that's what I was trying that's to That's only two. Because the word image appears twice. Yep, 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 yep. Both. And then also pick pix art on the bottom, scroll down. Pix art. not coming up. Make I'm boring. Oh, there it is. Pixar. Pixar. Yeah, Pixar. Yeah, Pixar. So okay. I can see only three. I don't see where the fourth is. Anyway. Yeah. Now the question is: Are those post-production or real-time digital signal processing of a live image coming in? Oh uh, no, I I don't think that's. Uh, I think it's a post-production. I don't know. I never tried them. All I can say is that that's that's how you locate. Because what I can do is in the past. Um, the noise on that camera was just one line of noise, and I could I could post process the MP4 videos to get rid maybe to get rid of the one line, but now it's like the whole top one third of the screen is noised up. Yeah, if you do that, you're gonna need a lot of CPU to do <laughs> busy catching up in real time. Yeah, yeah. Because the, the ones that I tried, I mean, I didn't try Adobe After Effects because they wanted 34 bucks for a one month. But I don't think you can do it live. But there'll be a three phase per production. Yeah. So my so I think that this old Canon camcorder is basically kaput. Yeah, I agree. Because I can't I, I can't seem to get that noised up upper half of the image to clean up. When it was only one line across it, sort of at the towards the top, it was not so bad, but now it's like it's like a whole band that's gone noisy. Yeah. So I think it's we're gonna have to retire this camcorder yeah it sounds like a good idea well the point was is that the the, the toastmasters club had bought this may, maybe 10 years ago for like 400 dollars yeah. and it had an hdmi output which then i was able to adapt to usb webcam format mm -hmm. using it but it either had or developed this this little noisy right. towards the top and i didn't even notice it at first but the president of the club had noticed it and yeah well, i would recommend you use it as a backup camera when you don't have anything else better to use that would be you know that's a backup camera well the reason i thought we might continue to use it because besides seeing the speaker at the podium who's mainly talking there's portions of the toastmasters meeting where you call on people in the audience for mm -hmm. a short response or you have to show the person holding up the colored cards for the timer because they right. hold up a green, yellow, and a red card when you're running out of time. Right. So it has to be a camera on the timer, right. so, assuming that you're not using electronic timing but the physical cards. Right. And when you're calling on people to respond to short responses, you have to be able to pan the room to see who's there. The remote people have to be able to see who's there. I thought this would work okay for either of those functions notwithstanding the noisy line, although maybe at this point it's gotten pretty bad. Well, the timer, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't need noisy, noisy line doesn't bother the timer, isn't it? No. And also, Zoom itself has some app, has some 
in application clock timer uh, functions right. that you can, and I haven't learned to use those. I mean, I, I know about them. Yeah. And so, and some of the apps in Zoom are premium and some are built in free. Right. Uh, but you have to learn to use them. If you're the timer, you got to figure out how to use the timer function. Not only you learn how to use it, you also need to teach people to use it when you're not around. Exactly. And <laughs> one, of the, one of the guys basically changed his background to solid green, solid yellow, and solid red to indicate the time. Then he had to have, you know, he had to have his, his laptop ready to do that. Right. And um, there's a whole lot of functions in hybrid meetings that are just a pain in the tuckus to... To, well, because it's, this this industry is not matured yet. When it's matured, it will I I will take over everything for you. Yeah. But I thought maybe next Thursday, because this camera is basically dying. Yeah, I, I will bring in um, the. So this is the camera you you sent me two. I mean, yeah, I sent you two. Right. Yeah. my face. You sent me two of these. Right. These are very similar to the Logitech, but right. not quite as spiffy as the Logitech. Right. And maybe what I'll do is because because you can mount them, it has the right. tripod mount. Right, right, right. I would mount that on the same tripod as the old Canon. Right. And I can't zoom them or pan them except by physically moving the tripod. So well, I you can zoom them. I think there's some software allow you to, you know, optically zoom or whatever they call that. Electronic zoom is what they say. The, the Logitech comes with a free electronic zoom pan and tilt right this generic one i have not found, i have not found a uh, a suitable freebie for the zoom pan and tilt i found something called ManyCam, nice. which which will do the zoom but it doesn't do the electronic uh selecting of the right, 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 frame right. you basically only zoom in the center right right you have to physically pan and tilt Right, right. But I may, I may try. To, the other problem with ManyCam is it puts a ManyCam logo at the bottom. Yeah, I know. It poses a logo. Yeah. And you have to buy the premium version if the you want to get rid yeah. of that. Right. And even then, I don't know that it has the electronic uh, select the portion. Right. Of it. So now I know the Logitech C9, 2930, and maybe later models have the electronic thingy, but then you got to bring up a whole control panel to run it. I wonder if you can use a security camera that you know they can follow people. <laughs> yeah, well, so. there's, there's something called Owl, which is like right. a thousand dollars. But here's the problem: Owl will automatically aim at who, wherever the sound is coming from. Right. And in a room full of people, the sound isn't always coming from one person. Right. And now you could I understand that with Owl, you can take over manual. Right. Of, of which direction is pointing. So now you have to be an electronic camera operator all the time. Right. And the other problem is, is the rooms in the community center, there was the handheld mic where the sound came out of speakers in the ceiling. But if you have six speakers in the ceiling, you've right. got the voice of God coming from everywhere and nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> and so anything that's right, where's the sound coming from? You know, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't know which way to point. Oh, the right. ceiling up there. <laughs> So if we show it's important, maybe you can put 10 cameras in the room. We thought we might be able to get away with a fixed camera at the podium. Right. And everybody has to go to the podium to speak. Right. And one or two cameras that will cover the room so the people at home can see who's present if right. they want to call on somebody for right. a, a query response portion of the meeting. But these hybrid meetings are getting to be really, really challenging. Uh, the, the problem with the uh, the poly polysync 40 phased array speakerphone is that if they're not really really close to the speaker that sounds not very good so we end up putting the, the polysync 40 on the podium so it's mm -hmm. literally right in front of the speaker and then the people in the room when they speak they they're basically their sound is really crap right well listen to all your what should i say scenario i would highly recommend that to have two types of meeting one is uh you know lo on location one is normal in person no yeah. no remote and there was zoom only no no hybrid yeah. and i right. proposed that yeah. i repeatedly proposed that over the last four months yeah nobody pays attention to a damn thing i say 
Yeah, because you are you are you are burdening the you are shouldering all the burden yourself. So there's no pain in them, and it's the pain is on you. <laughs> I mean, at one time people were bringing their own laptops into the room, and then I tell them you have to mute your speaker and you have to mute your mic because you can't have your audio on. Right, right. And then when I spotlight them to yeah. bring up the video on their laptop, they have to not click the connect to audio prompt. Right. With spotlighting, so. We tried that for a while and it sort of worked. People eventually learned uh, not to turn on their audio when they got a prompt. Or, you know, they, they didn't necessarily have their laptops positioned so that they were centered. Right. And so we sometimes had to go up there and <laughs> move their laptops so they were on camera. And then we tried using, you know, the handheld room mic with the voice of God and that didn't work. <laughs> right, right. right. So I look at it through perspective now that you tell me this. So the next feedback that I get for you is this. Nobody have a hybrid interview or public speaking arrangement. Nobody has that. Everybody yeah. either have on location or virtual, right? So yeah. it's not very useful to have a, you know, a hybrid meeting practice for, you know, for the group. So the next thing I would suggest is take two weeks off let them deal with it and then come back two weeks later and make their proposal again and see what happens. Yeah, we'll see. We Unfortunately, we have five people who are routinely remote. One of them for the summer is in Ireland. So he has to be remote. Right. And, uh, one of them is so hard of hearing that the only way she can hear is if she's in front of her laptop with the, with the live uh, audio coming out of the laptops. So right. she works from home. We have one person who wears a hearing aid that she turns the gain up so loud that it squeals at 18,000 hertz that she can't hear, but we can. So we have three people who are hard of hearing, one person who's not even in the country, and one person who routinely connects remotely because they don't want to drive all the way to the, to the to the community center and drive back home again. Yeah, want to limit their time to uh, one hour. Right. And so half of the people, or at least six of the people, are routinely remote. Yeah. And about another six are in person. Yeah. He said, if we go to remote only, well, yeah. remote only, everybody could be remote, but in person only, you'd be down to like six people. That's fine. Remember, yeah. you're here to practice speaking. Whether one audience or five audience or three audience, it makes no difference whatsoever. The problem is, is that we have a total of 20 people who have, have membership. Now they don't all come every week. So we might have 12 people on any given week, but now the problem is it takes them a year to have their chance to give one talk. Right. So they have to wait a year for their turn to give a talk. They're right. saying, well, what's the point of Toastmasters if I never get to speak except once a That's year? Right. That's right. If you split into two, the hybrid or the on location, now you got half a year to talk instead of <laughs> one year to talk because you now split it into two, right? You got two so, weeks going on. So, so the wrestling with this structure that was introduced in 1903. Right. Postmaster's model was introduced by Ralph Smedley at the YMCA in Bloomington, Illinois in 1903 to serve inarticulate wayward male adolescents. Right. He said there's, you know, all the kids who are going to school, these wayward male adolescents who are really flunkies, you know, not quite juvenile delinquents. He thought, have them come to the YMCA they're going to speak eyeball to eyeball, face to face, you know, oral communication to a yeah. small number of people. And, and that became the model for Toastmasters. Yeah. And in 1923, he reprised that same model in San Diego. And that was the very first chapter of Toastmasters that became known as Toastmasters. Right. Still males only. It was face to face. Right. Oral communication, eyeball to eyeball in a small room. And that started in 1923, and no women allowed. In 1973, 50 years later, that same chapter in San Diego, which had a lot of naval personnel in it, because there's the Navy base in San Diego, the wife of one of the naval officers decided that she wanted to join her husband in Toastmasters. So she joined the local chapter, and they put in her name for you know the national uh, registration as Helen Blanchard. And they said, Helen, that's a female. We No, we're male only. So then 
Then they snuck her in as H. Blanchard and didn't reveal that she was female. And that created a scandal when it was discovered that H. Blanchard was Helen Blanchard. And after two years of wrangling, like 1975, Toastmasters finally relented and allowed women in. Yeah. Helen Blanchard became the president of the local chapter in San Diego, and a few years later became the president of Toastmasters International. Wow. <laughs> so there's there's this famous story of Helen Blanchard who snuck in pretending to, to be in uh, non-gendered and right, then becomes right. the president. But in the meantime, the curriculum was still the same curriculum that Ralph Smedley had introduced in 1923 when mm. there's no technology. Yeah. It's always, it had to be in person because, you know, radio and television didn't, well, radio existed, right. but, you, know, you know, ordinary people didn't have, except for the telephone. Everybody did have the telephone by 1930, right. but other than that, and then eventually, especially with COVID, you know, people began to do uh, visual aids and occasionally they'd give a talk that involved um, PowerPoint maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, or maybe a, a, a flip chart, or maybe view graph overhead projector stuff. So they gradually enlarged it from oral communication to multimedia, visual aids, and and eventually because of COVID, you know, Zoom. But the basic model is still what Ralph Smedley designed, you know, 120 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the goal, if I can get remember, I did join a couple of sessions of Toastmaster. The goal, if I remember, is that you get rid of the mm and the ah and the right. pause and and be uh, pronounce it clearly, slowly, every word you say, so that people can understand what you're saying. So as far as and also stage fright, you worry about stage fright, get rid of the stage fright as well. So from my perspective, it's like if you do a public speaking virtually versus in person are two different experience altogether. Right. And when you try to combine the two technologies together and struggling and with hell, the technology hell, you yeah. will get distracted from my perspective. Exactly. And that, and so you have two factions. You have the faction who thinks that this is designed for public oral speaking face to face, Yeah. small audience you know, no technology. And then there's the Marshall McLuhan faction who thinks the medium is the message and you have to learn to communicate through multiple media yeah. of the 21st century and not just eyeball, eyeball face-to-face, That's you know, right. acoustic communication. And so we, we're kind of schisming between the people who want to stick to the 120-year-old version of the curriculum and people who want to evolve to the 21st century. you got YouTube, you got... Uh, Bot podcasts, you got you know all this different internet social networks, and people need to learn to communicate multimedia. Yeah. Like Marshall McLuhan points out, learn to use the media. Right. And and I think we're gonna schism into into two factions. I would say three. Three. I thought to you already. So you have a a virtual version, in-person version, and then there's a hybrid version. Right. And I thought maybe we should have one meeting a month that's in person, right. one meeting a month that's that's remote only, hybrid, right. Zoom only, right. one meeting a month that's that's hybrid. Right. That's maybe right. the fourth meeting a month of some other combination, thing. right, or YouTube or whatever. So, from my perspective, we say you can have the three meeting or four meeting a month, so that the person that need to get to speak. The, the, the thing about improvement, you can only get from feedback. For God's sake, you only get one feedback per damn year. Like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> what? And, and, and because of the problem of only one feedback, they tried a new model where you give a speech, a, a regular speech in the curriculum, and you would get um, the feedback first from the, the assigned evaluator and then a chance for everybody else to give a, a brief evaluation. And then you would repeat your speech the next week Right. To see if you could make it better based on all the feedback. So then instead of giving one talk a year, you gave the same talk twice in a row, right. which right. meant that everybody had to wait practically nine months for their turn. That's right. So this is what I mean by you need an asynchronized platform where the you know the feedback can be given in an asynchronized format, meaning they can record their feedback later. And the, right. the part of the recording of the feedback become the feedback of the feedback so that how you 
you know, say your feedback verbally, digitally, and all that stuff. So again, it, it could convert it into something that you can get about 10 feedback per month kind of scenario. Yeah. So, I mean, I spent a year, once we went to hybrid meetings, which was, I think, a year ago, I, you know, went all these different ways of trying to figure out how to do the technology for hybrid meetings with a portable TV studio and a satchel. Right. Ending up with, you know, this this camcorder with the adapter and 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 the polycom uh speaker phone and all even though it sort of worked it wasn't studio quality yeah it wasn't msnbc or fox it wasn't you know wasn't no, what even close not even close yeah. yeah and the point is is that people realize well the audio is crappy you know the video coverage isn't three camera coverage and and they keep thinking, well, if you get if you buy a better camera and a better laptop, you'll you know, no, because you got one guy was bringing in a late model laptop and a late model Logitech C930 camera on a tripod. Mm. He didn't know how to turn on the camera. He didn't know how to connect to Zoom. He didn't know how to connect the camera to Zoom. He didn't know how to aim the camera. He didn't know anything. Yeah, he he spent all this money on you know the laptop and the camera, and finally I had to say, the guy sitting next to you has to control the camera. Right. So and, again, I, I just skip. This is a very typical technology distraction world. Okay, I want to do one thing, I get distracted like a car. You know, you got all kinds of gadget in the car now that was not there before, right? right. And you and then you know. So whatever, whenever you're working, you got this email spam that get distract you and all that stuff. So distractions everywhere. So the question is, are you focusing on what you're trying to supposedly practicing sp public speaking or you get distracted by technology? So if the distraction of the technology is so great that then the public speaking become number, goal number five. If I got this working, if I got that working, if I got not distracted, then, then and I cannot deliver a presentation. Yeah. And and basically, the people who are on the the officers of the club, the president and the other off elected officers, are basically calling the shots. So the, we have a new president who took over in July, and she says everybody coming to the room and bringing their own laptop, they're looking at their laptop instead of looking at the people. So she says, let's get rid of all the laptops except the one that you at least the one that you need to, you know, for the people for the Zoom for remote. Right. And I said, "What? Wait a minute! Somebody has to operate, you know, the camera and the and the uh, speaker phone. We we need a tech team who at least, you know, have extra laptops. So we have this sort of thing with fewer laptops in the room. Now everybody has to get up and go in front of the podium. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they can't be seen or heard. And we have this mixed bag that's really so suboptimal. <laughs> and so I say, the oh, solution is." Here's the person holding up the colored colored card for the timer, and that person's on not on a camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I say you need to have three setting. Right. Yeah. So I said, I said, let's let's have one in person only, one hybrid only, one uh, one uh, Zoom only, right. and figure out what do you want to do with the fourth or the fifth Thursday right. of the month. Right. And basically, the tech guy who knows what's technologically possible with with technicians and what the hell they're doing versus the officers of the club who haven't a clue, you know, right. how, how to envision um, a model that's practical in the 21st century wow. with inexpensive equipment. So if I may say this to you, so the way I say it is that the, the meaning of communication is the response that you receive, right? Right. So if the meaning of if the meaning of the communication is the response you receive. So from my perspective, so if you're doing public speaking, for example, if you're allowed to use video, you can use audio. You know, a lot of famous people when they do a public speaking, they first start with a five minutes video that with graphics and with text and with audio and all that multimedia stuff is such a good thing that can explain a picture is worth a thousand words. Okay. Right. So that you already beat the heck out of everything, all the mouth you can do from your mouth, right? So from my perspective, it's like, so how could you increase the rate of understanding the meaning that you, you know, be able to communicate in such a way that is maximized? 
Yeah. And puppy speaking with your mouth, with the Zoom, is, and in, in, in person, is no match for this multimedia presentation at all. Yeah. People, I mean, people were giving talks where they were screen sharing their PowerPoint slides or, or photographs of their trip to Europe or whatever they were doing. They were already doing multimedia presentations even before COVID. One, one of the uh, modules in the curriculum was to do multimedia. Now you could use flip charts, you could use a uh, view graph, you know, right. or you could use the- uh, um, YouTube. You, well, not YouTube, but your, your laptop and something, you know, projecting something from your laptop onto a projector screen. Right. And with Zoom, you can do screen sharing. So people have been doing this as part of the curriculum, even though the original curriculum was eyeball to eyeball, face to face, oral communication and no visual aids. Right. <laughs> The only visual aid basically was gestures. Yeah. The thing was, you know, modulate your voice and, you know, feel free to move around and do gestures. But That's moving right. around and do gestures doesn't work if you end up off camera. That's right. I mean, yeah. The, the, uh, the way I say it is that maximize your flexibility and minimize your expectation, you know, so. so and, and I'm not even there to learn to be a public speaker. Because when I speak, it's mostly technical stuff. It's academic stuff. Right. That audience of people who attend Toastmasters aren't there to hear what I have to say. <laughs> they don't care about systems thinking and systems theory and you know 21st century technology. They could care less. Right. Tell their, their little 10 minute stories. Right. You know, and get a laugh. And yeah. which is fine, but then what are you doing in these damn hybrid meetings? So, you know, you need I'm the I'm the for the longest time, I was the only person who could do the, the technology. Right, no. Now we've got two people who are semi-competent. That's nice. Enough. I mean, we have one guy who can host the Zoom meeting. Right. And we have a new guy who knows enough to be able to set up a camera and aim it and, you know, do all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and, and when, when the uh, internet went down in the community center, he, he brought out his smartphone and made a hotspot. <laughs> yeah. So we could, get, we could get back on the internet using his hotspot. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Again, there's too many distractions. The main event, the purpose of main event became distracted. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, it, it makes a story of, it's a little bit, little bit like the sitcom, The Big Bang Theory. Most right. entertainment is things that go, go awry. It, the story is everything goes awry and you fumble and mumble around to try to straighten out the mess. But most of the story is, you know, dealing with the things that, uh, the unexpected things. Right, right, right. And you go back to what we talked about yesterday about system, I mean, about, you know, the chaos and then you get protocol to deal with and all that stuff. So the question becomes, how could the protocol help in this situation? Yeah. I mean, one problem is, the, the rooms in the community center, some of the rooms have windows in them. So some people will be sitting in front of a window and the sun is coming in through the window behind them and right. washing them out. That's right. And I tell people, do not, if you're going to be on camera, don't sit in front of the sunny window. Right. <laughs> so which of these was I using? That one? I can't remember which one I was using. No, it was this one. Yeah, it's nice. Oh, good. Yeah. So. Taking this, you know, the rules, do you have some rules that are being set by the president of the club, right? So yeah. that doesn't work very well. So now you need to elevate it to the next level, which is protocol, and then go on to the next level of function, then right. models and system and right. I shift. So the question is, how could you help the entire rules of the public speaking, learning platform into a next level? And the answer is their eyes glaze over when the likes of me starts talking about protocols and functions and models and systems. Now, we have another guy who's a life coach who could be the spokesperson, the spokesman, yeah. Yeah. Who, who, who knows how to explain this to a lay audience. No. My problem is I know that I know it too deep to be able to communicate to a lay audience because I don't know how to simplify things down to the kindergarten level. Okay. And I need people who, who understand it enough and can communicate the concepts to a lay audience. And I can do that. Wrong. I mean, if you if you invite him to this conversation, I'll be glad to be the the. I may not do a perfect job, but I can do at least an eighty percent job. 
to to explain the you know what do we, what do you mean by from the rules to become protocol to protocol? I mean, yeah. So what I'm going to do is just like I uh, tagged you on a on a thread in Facebook. Right. I'm going to tag you on another thread, <laughs> which, is, which is basically the same story, where we have the schism between you know the the century old communication model and right. the post Marshall McLuhan model. Right. And like we're going to either have to you know you have to say yes to one and let the other one go. Right. Or have a schism and have two different communities. Right. Um, I don't think we can, I mean, we can try to do both. We can try to accommodate, you know, multiple factions, but I think I'm thinking that it's probably not going to work at least. I don't think so. First of all, this is what I call by oneness with duality. Okay. <laughs> I don't see that as dual community. I don't, see, I don't see it's a dual community. I'm talking about, let's say, okay. yeah. So, so talk about virtual meetings and the uh, in-person meeting. Yeah. Do you see that as a two separate group? I don't see that as a two separate group. Well, I could see it as in alternate weeks, we focus on one of the three models, in-person, Zoom only, and hybrid. And, and right. three third okay, so, so you call it three separate group. I don't call it three separate group. I call it three different opportunity. You are welcome to join all three of them you're welcome to join just one of them or two of them as you're choosing. So it's a three opportunities, not three different groups. The, the, the recurring issue is that the people at home, the remote people either say, I couldn't hear that person because they weren't mic'd very well, or I couldn't see that person because I didn't even know they were there and I couldn't call on them. Okay. See, people at, the remote people are the most disadvantaged. Right. But when you're in the room, the three people who are hard of hearing they can't hear the person sitting, you know, 20 feet away from them unless they turn up their hearing aid to the point where it starts squealing. <laughs> right. So, so then if we use the, the room mic with the voice of God coming out of the speakers, then the remote people are getting this reverberation <laughs> coming in through the, through the uh, polycom speak, uh, speaker phones, and they can't understand it because it's reverber it's a it's the union station now right on like rock 29 That's right. <laughs> so we offer a buffet of choices that will suit and maybe we should put all the hard to hearing people in one group they call hard to hearing in person god's voice group so that would be 3.1 instead of you know the group number three they'll have a 3.1 group you're accommodating this wide demographic right why do, and the problem is we're not serving any demographic particularly well. Well, from my perspective, again, you come back to the meta perspective, you know, structure, create behavior. Once you put a structure in place, the behavior will come out or the behavior will be created from the structure, right? So, so again, let's, for example, the hard to hearing group. If you put all the hard hearing group together, <laughs> it's not a problem you. because you have, you have, remember, Low expectation, maximum flexibility. We are flexible. We can change whatever structure that you need us to be to serve you, but we cannot have we cannot serve two separate groups, right? By the way, there's a fourth, there's a fifth group. We have one guy, Rob Cancer, who speaks very loud. His voice carries, and then we have Bob Avaloni, who's very soft spoken, and even if he's right in front of the of the of the microphone, you still can't hear him. And, mm -hmm. and he was he was on a laptop where if he faced the laptop, he could hear him. But if you looked at his notes over here, suddenly his voice, you know, faded because yeah, right. the microphone on the laptop was very directional. Right. And so here's the, he was the president of the club and both people couldn't hear what he said because he was so soft-spoken. <laughs> you know, we, we, you know, it was, it was, you pull, well, you can pull your hair out if you have any hair to pull out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so see, now you have five groups. So remember, I keep saying to you, Dif different needs, if you can group them together as a pattern recognition, we were talking about yesterday. I'm an expert on pattern recognition. Once you recognize a pattern, you know what's wrong. Like square peg, round hole, remember right. those those learning classes? You know, like pattern recognition is so important. So once you recognize that there's a need for a new creation of a separate group so that that behavior can be served or whatever you call that, right? So by the way, you see where, where Sam put in the chat about OWL. Now, the community center turns out bought an owl. Right. And we thought, oh, 
are we allowed to, can we borrow and use the owl in our meetings? And they said, no, the owl, which is a thousand dollars is only for the staff of the community center to have meetings with the rest of the uh, town officials, the library and the, and the, and the city. Yeah. Hall. They worry and, about getting damaged. Worry about getting so, damaged. So, so then the guy who, who's most in favor of eyeball to eyeball, face to face in the room, he says, you know, you can buy an owl. I said, yeah, we can buy an owl. So it's a thousand dollars. We can't use the one that the community center owns. And if you're in a room where like we're in, you're going to have to have somebody manually steer the owl because this automatic steering ain't going to work when you've got this kind of a non-studio room. I mean, it, it's it's great if the owl is smart enough to know who's talking, but it's well, not. The, it way, the, the, way the, you, the way that you saw this owl problem is you put three owl in there. For six people. <laughs> Three, well, that's the same as putting in everybody has their own laptop. Yeah, no different. And, ha and has to be told. And by the way, when you connect to Zoom, turn off your speaker and turn off your mic. <laughs> right, right. And, and aim your laptop at your face. You know, we had people when we were on Zoom during the COVID, we would have people who were, you know, reading their notes like this. Yeah. And, and they weren't on, they didn't know this, they didn't bother to see if they were on camera. Yeah, yeah. And and Rob Kanzer, who was present for most of that time, kept explaining to people, make sure that you're on camera. Go ahead and use some gestures, you know. And and he was explaining, he looked, look at the camera, don't look at your notes. Yeah. He every every week he would remind people, oh, right. and turn off your cell phone. We have people, for example, who don't turn off their telephone. Yeah. Or, you know, it's really annoying. Windows. When you get a notification, it goes ding dong. Right. And and there are people remote who who have their notifications turned on and they have their mic open. Right. That is to say they're not muted. And every time they get a notification, their picture comes up <laughs> because Zoom switches to their ding dong. That's right. And, and I have to turn around and mute them because they have their notification ding dong running. Right, right. Or they move their chair. You can, you can set up so that when you get into a Zoom session, everybody get muted except one, right? Something uh, like that. The problem is they turn on their, their microphone to speak, and then they forget to turn it off. Yeah. Or another issue, they try to send messages in chat. Right. And people does not even know that chat exists or to look at it. Right. Yeah, so yeah. we're sending somebody, you know, please mute or whatever. Now, what, when, when I am made a co-host, I can mute somebody. Right. Uh, but then, then they have to be told to unmute. And there was one lady, the one who was hard of hearing, who would take her five minutes to figure out how to turn her mic back on again. She didn't know where to find the, you know, the click to turn on her mic. So they'd call on her or be her turn. And we would sit there waiting for her, trying to tell her, go down to the left, find the little icon that looks like a microphone, click this, you know, make sure this. And she would click it twice, which is on and off. <laughs> right, 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 right. So it, it, Hearing you so far, so it tells me that the two things I want to make comment. One is that this is a group of old folks. That it's a community gathering that's having fun together and solving problems together and tell story, whatever. It's deviated from the original 1903 for the young kids, you know, high school graduate, whatever that is. So it's deviated from. So this is an entertainment group, not a not a public speaking learning group. So I was saying, you know, instead of having this rigid regimented agenda curriculum maybe once a month we should have not a fixed speech that somebody's going to give but a roundtable discussion on a, on a defined topic that's so right let's say here's a topic and everybody's going to be allotted five minutes right to, to recite their premeditated opinion on this topic and right. then at the end of it the moderator is, is supposed to summarize all the diverse right. opinions and, right. and I said that would be allow people to, to be able to speak. I agree. Five minutes in an hour. And yeah. you, could probably, you could probably get uh, 10 people five minutes, right. that's 50 minutes. And then right. the moderator could spend five minutes summarizing. And then at the beginning of the five minutes, sort of getting set up and do that once a month and, and throw away this, this you know, yeah. that's funny. Or, uh, model where you're going to give a, a 12 minute talk um, and be evaluated on it. I mean, Give people, you know, what we don't have to stick with Ralph Smedley's model from 1903 for wayward 
at inarticulate wayward adolescence in the YMCA in Bloomington, Illinois. That's right. So the hell? thing is, again, it's two different functions now. One is that, you know, you were designed, the whole structure was designed for young people to learn how to public speaking and they need that for survival. They need that to, to, to earn a living. They need that to communicate clearly, right? And now you talk about also they have the hard of hearing and they don't really need to make any living. They are all retired and right. they have a different purpose of it. They are just use this, they want to feel young again. They feel like <laughs> they, they step into the teenager or whatever you want to call that. So and then we have the young people who want to be able to use Zoom and podcast and YouTube and social networks and blogs. And they right. want to be able to communicate to a worldwide audience and not a face-to-face -face audience in the YMCA, you know, down the street from where they live. So right. we, want, we want to be able to um, support people whose communication needs are what Marshall McLuhan pointed right. out, multimedia. All right. I mean, I asked, uh, I asked Bud to explain the rules and the protocol and the function and all that stuff. We said it in the chat so that, what's well, up, there's too much here, I guess, too. Text too wrong. Actually, I I did the same thing um, months ago. I asked Bard to read that that blog post of mine on right. rules, protocols, functions, models, systems, right. and it came back with basically a page long right. summary, yeah. which I then posted on uh, I think Facebook. Right. So this is Bard's explanation of. Yeah. It's very probably, probably very similar to the one that 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 Bard or maybe it was Chat GPT. Right, right, right. We both did did from my blog post um, a few months ago. Right. So rules are instruction that tells us what to do. Like if the president make a decision, you cannot use our and you need to do this. You need to do that. They can be explicit, implicit, and they can be used to guide our behavior, make decision or solve a problem. So you see, it's more like a young child, young, you know, teenager, whatever you call that, rules work very well because they, they're learning and the rules is like guardrails that help them to do whatever they need to get done in the most, well, as I say, effective ways. Yeah. Speak, speak when it's your turn. Don't That's interrupt right. people because then nobody can hear anybody. Right. The simple rules that, which I don't even to remember to follow, I tend to interrupt people. <laughs> depend who you're talking to, depend on the topic, it's, you pinch your nerve or something. Protocol set a rule that how allowing different systems to communicate. See, that's what I mean by meta model. So the, the protocol is a meta model of the rules. So protocol are set of rules that allow different systems to communicate with each other. They define how data is exchanged between systems and they ensure the data is interpreted correctly. So, right. so again, if you see clearly, it's a simple term, it's a meta level. It's like, it's like, okay. It's an next higher level of sophistication above yeah. kindergarten. Kindergarten rules work with five year olds. Right. But at some point, you want to, uh, you want to upgrade to uh, something more sophisticated. Yeah, you you call it it's like walking a dog. The short leash or the longer leash. The right. the, the protocol is a longer leash. Right. No no guardrail, no training wheel that stop you from whatever whatever because you know how to balance already. So the training will go away, right? If the dog wants to do catch a frisbee and do break dancing on yeah. the sidewalk, you know, fine. You know, let's do break dancing and play frisbee instead of just That's right. a simple walk. And then functions are blocks of code that can be reused. They are a way of packaging up a set of fun instructions so that they can be used over and over again. So again, it's elevated up to the next level, the what I call meta levels. Models now are representations of real world object or system. They can be used to understand how the system works to make prediction and how it will behave or to simulate the system in the control environment. Again, it's, it's good to the next level. Yeah. And that's the whole point is that most of our species, the layperson is stuck at the kindergarten rule level. Yeah. Our governments are operating at the rule level. Yeah. Um, and I think, my God, I mean, here we are, we're 6,000 years into Western civilization. You know, we're in the 21st century of the information age. We got the internet, which demonstrates 
the the facility of protocol based communication and function yeah. high functioning and model based why the hell can't this species homo schleppians upgrade with all this example examples of high tech non living systems technology systems that are operating at a very high level why are we stuck at the kindergarten level well, from my perspective, is survival is about unless there's a way to control the cloud, you won't survive anyway. And and a lot of people, the Jared Diamonds of the world, think we're going to go extinct because we're so freaking primitive that we can't evolve to a to a cooperative society, nonviolent, cooperative, high functioning society. And and here we are, Homo sapiens sapiens. We're the sixth edition of of hominids. The first five of them all went extinct. And a lot of people think that our uh, edition of hominids is also going to go extinct because we can't evolve to live in a high tech 21st century culture where the world is changing out from under us, becoming progressively less habitable. And we're, and we're introducing all this, this uh, violence into the culture because of politics. He thinks that, you know, the insects, are gonna, the insects will, will uh, outlive us. Because insect doesn't have this, what I call the weapon of mass, mass destruction that we do. And, and know, by the way, and the birds, you know, interestingly enough, the dinosaurs went extinct from this asteroid, but the birds are the descendants of the dinosaurs. So yeah. it could very well be that the dinosaurs' descendants, the birds, and, and maybe the insects, uh, will survive us after, after our species just basically makes the world uninhabitable for Homo schleppians. I mean, the reason birds survive, from my perspective, or whatever you call that, you can fly away from the disaster, you know, so we are attached to the ground because we can only fly. Yeah. I don't actually know how it was that the birds managed to um, survive through that period where you had the, the out, you know, the, the atmospheric outfall of, of the uh, Chicxulub asteroid. Somehow or other, they they, bur they buried themselves under, I don't know what the hell they did, but somehow the birds managed to survive and they're the descendants of the dinosaurs. And bury is one thing. I mean, you get lucky if you bury, you're in the, you happen to be in the cave that the opening is not too exposed to the heat or whatever it is, right? So, but the key thing from my perspective is your ability to fly away that that people that walk on the ground, you know, with the feet, without wind, we cannot fly away that, you know, that, that's the choice. Maybe it's the fun. bird, maybe the birds that were you know, in, in Antarctica or Australia or wherever who were, you know, opposite side of the earth from, from uh, the Yucatan, maybe that's where the birds survived. I, I suppose that everything that was near the Yucatan probably didn't survive. So you can ask a chat GDP or the bird, birds about why birds survive. Maybe we can learn from the bird and model the birds model so that we can survive this one also. <clears throat> I mean, the, the tiny mammals who were bur burrowing mammals survived and right. the insects that were uh, you know, burrowed into the ground. The, the locusts, the 17 year locusts who stay underground for 17 years, right. come out every 17 years, which is, which is a prime number and that's the key. Mm. 13 and 17 year locusts, they come up and because it's a prime number, there would be predators can't get in sync with them. Mm. Because they got, they also have to have a thirteen or seventeen year cycle. Because they come up any other year, there's no food. They can't eat the locusts. Right, I see. So the locusts ended up, you know, uh, going underground for a prime, a, a big prime number of years. Mm. So perhaps the the locusts they said didn't survive, but the the eggs or the whatever you call that, the 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 eggs will survive. You know, so the eggs is. Doesn't need a different level of survival environment or whatever. Look at the, the axolotl is this uh, amphibian in that lives in these lakes in Mexico that dry up, and they can survive in a dried up lake and not come out until a rain, which might come every you know, five years. And when there's a rain, then they come out. And 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 the uh, flora in Death Valley, they you know, the seeds are underground until there's a rain and. Rain rain once every seven years, and then they bloom for a month right. or two. So from my perspective, unless you can do small things, how could you do the big thing? Because big, big things aggregate of all the small things. So from my perspective, if you cannot solve the, the community, small community, six 
remote six you know on site group how could that's hopelessly we can solve the million billions of people's group right so so you can do the best you can with inexpensive salvaged equipment that didn't cost any for example the other club the lexington community the lexington computer and technology group they did a, a lot of research and they ended up buying a modern webcam and, and a poly and a polysync 40 they spent nearly a thousand dollars after researching it and they basically gave up trying to do hybrid meetings yep in the way that toastmasters i try to to support hybrid meetings with cast off zero cost equipment one of the things that, that they try to do in toastmasters is that a couple times a year um they have a they have a a, a buffet lunch yeah. where they buy the food now the, the last buffet lunch, I think we spent three or three hundred dollars to serve about twenty-five people. Came in person, and I pointed out. I said the reason that you can do two or three buffet lunches a year is I didn't blow a thousand dollars on trying to buy high-tech equipment. If I had to spend a thousand dollars, I'd have emptied your bank account, and you couldn't have a. I, I said I'd rather have a, a buffet lunch, uh, you know, two or three times a year than than to buy a thousand dollars of equipment which doesn't do any better than this the zero cost junk that I'm using. Also, that's a different perspective as well. Unless that's crime, you know, the policeman is out of job, right? So unless that's problem for you to solve, they would have fun working with the group. I'm trying to, I'm trying to make my job obsolete. <laughs> I'm, I want somebody like the new kid, Josh Healy, no, Josh Leahy is his name, who can basically do everything that I've been doing and I don't need to be there every week to, to schlep in a portable TV studio and a satchel, set it up, run the you know, run the technology section, tear it all down, take it home, recharge all the batteries. I'm spending probably 12 hours a week between the meeting itself and stuff at home. And I'm going in, and the people who are doing the talks, you know, they're assigned to give a talk. They maybe spend an hour at home practicing their talk and they give a talk for an hour and they're done two hours a week for people who are participating. And I got to be there every week, 12 hours a week at you know, homework and everything else. And it's it's nuts. You know, if if I were if I were being paid for this, they would be paying me, I don't know, three hundred dollars a week to do yes. this. But the thing is, you have fun doing it, don't you think? I mean, don't you feel that you have a compelling reason that they're serving the community, serving the the need of, of the group of people that you love and hang out with and interaction and all that, that give you activities, that give you an excuse to get out of the house? Solving the problem in the first place, that is coming up with technology that is usable. Right. That was a lot of fun. Right. Running it, having to be there every week, not even be able to take a week off, every week, 50 weeks a year, uh, that part gets old fast. Yeah, that, that's what I call the expectation part. <laughs> it's like when I worked at Bell Laboratories, the people at Bell Labs designed the telephone network, but we were not the operating company. We right. were running the telephone day in and day out. Yeah. We were designing the system and then handing off the operation side yeah. to the operator. So we were, were at the switchboard being an operator. Yeah. And, and the point is, is that I have to be set up the camera run the system i have to be an operator and I have to solve the problems i have to do if you go to a tv studio right and a lot of towns have a little you know closed circuit tv studio for people who want to make recordings or whatever they've got a lighting director a set decorator a ca three camera operators a, a technical director a, a post-production editor they've got half a dozen people when you see the credits you see half a dozen people who are behind it not one person who's doing all the jobs at the same right, time. Right, right, right. So your job, perhaps, is to enroll young young people, young young kids, or whatever you call that, young men, young ladies, right. to the group, so that you say part of the benefit is say I will teach you how right. to run the show. So you that want to learn to be a camera operator. You want to learn to be a director who picks what which yeah. camera to select. Yeah. And, you want to be an audio engineer. You want yeah. to be a lighting director. You right. want to be a, a, a floor manager who plans the layout yeah. of the room. Well, you know, all of that stuff. To, you need to improve the, the agenda from the 1903 version, you I, know? I, I've been proposing that for a couple of years now. Yeah. And I, I they don't heed 
they don't heed the engineers. <laughs> it, it's like the prophets in biblical times. Never, nobody yeah. ever heeded the prophets. The prophet says, if you don't, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going, you guys are going to go extinct. Right. You have to adopt a, a sustainable civilization model, and they never listen to the to the prophets. And and Jared Diamond says, look how many civilizations went extinct. The Roman civilization collapsed. All these civilizations collapsed because they had unsustainable political models or civilization models or economic models. Well, the political system is necessary to survive today, right? It doesn't I mean, guarantee terrible. the survival of the future. I mean, it, it's quite possible in the 22nd century that homo schleppians will fade away and, and non-living automata will, will take over the earth. And they will be able to they'll be able to regenerate new, you know, new automata, self-reproducing automata, and they can, you know, recycle all their stuff. It's quite possible that non-biological systems will supplant the biological systems in the 22nd or 23rd century, assuming that there is anything left to do in the 23rd century. I mean, all you need to do is do what do what the green leafy vegetables do, capture some photons from the sun and use the energy of those photons to do whatever you got to do. I don't think it's going to be that hard for non-living systems to be able to, to capture solar energy and basically maintain a sustainable system. They're going to have enough intelligence and enough automata, mechanical automata and enough energy uh, producing systems to be able to do everything that living systems are doing and will become their pets. Yeah. Humans will become the dogs and the cats of the, of the technology systems of the 22nd century. What I, what I noticed is that people live in a remote island where you have natural resources, you foot on the trees and foot on the, in the ground, have no modern conveniences like electricity and internet and all that stuff. They have less bill to pay. They have less responsibility and they have less problem. Back to the hunter-gatherers. You know, if you, live <laughs> on, if you live on a lush island, the Garden of Eden, Eden Island, and you got the coconuts and the fish and everything, and, you know, you can, grab, you can grab a, a, a guave off of the tree and eat it, or bananas or whatever, Yeah. And, and you don't need, you know, you don't even have to wear clothes. You can, you yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, why? I mean, I can see that you know, you, we could go back to being. It's, it's like the, uh, you know, the the primitives in in um, what's the name of that Guinea, whatever the name of those little islands are, where you have people who are living like humans lived fifty thousand years ago. Yeah. No technology. You can't. I mean, yeah, if you see, animals, you don't. You don't need get get treatment. You die anyway. It's just I like. Got I got squirrels and, and rabbits right outside who are living off of the land. Nobody's right. taking care of them. They don't have television, radio, telephones, the internet. The rabbit will come and nibble on, you know, some foliage or whatever. The, the squirrel will find some nuts from the tree and they're surviving just fine with no technology in the wild. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and no, no, species, no, no political leaders. <laughs> no political leaders. Our species did that until about 50,000 years ago when we started forming tribes yeah. and, you know, and cooperating to, to hurt, you know, to catch the, you know, the, the deer or whatever the animals were that they were hurting and not hurting, but yeah. capturing. And, and, you know, we gradually began to take over the food supply of around 12,000 years ago. And that's why we have politics to manage the notion that we have ownership of the food supply and management of the food supply and, commerce and trade and don't steal my food I, that's all politics is because of the agrarian culture and once you're on the on this train you cannot go back you're on this train track not unless we somehow automate the food supply production so that you don't have to have food, humans in the food supply and and you know you're I can put it in front of my face and 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 the things that you need are so plentiful that you don't have to buy them, pay for them. You know, pencils are basically free. <laughs> right. And, and you know, you can, a you know, piece of chalk or whatever. So you can have things that are essentially so plentiful that they're, you don't have to have rules to price and buy and manufacture and sell them. They're just there. 
But then, you know, when, when the problem between the groups of people, between two people, you need to have higher power to take over, like the policeman, the judge, and the, you know, all that stuff. The I mean, structure look, need to be there. Look what's happening. Um, wh which is the country in South America that's democracy is undermined in, in West Africa with the Wagner group basically doing yeah. all these military yeah. bunches? And here in the United States, democracy and the rule of law are under attack by the former president. Yeah. He's basically gonna, gonna stress out the rule of law, rule out the legal system, rule out, you know, uh, stress out the, the justice system. And there is a significant chance that he will so weaken and undermine the um, political system, the legal system, the governmental system, that it'll fail like it has failed. Look at how many failed states there are around the world where military juntas and strong men and civil wars have basically uh, you know, undermined the, uh, the governmental systems. Could, and it can happen here. I mean, we had a civil war. We yeah. had a revolutionary war. We, you know, we, we founded this country on a revolutionary war against the King of England, and then we had a civil war over slavery and states' rights. Yeah. Now we're having a war over whether we want to be a democracy, a republic, or um, a strongman, you know, uh, autocracy. Yeah. Fa fascist autocracy. So again, the rule now elevate the next to the protocol. So how could the protocol help in this situation? You got to go up to. So if you want to regulate a system, you have to. If you have a system model that's that's decent, you can solve the system model for a regulatory mechanism to re to have a well regulated system. Now nature has been doing this for millions of years. Nature has a way of well regulating systems that are sustainable. That's why they're sustainable because they're well regulated. And the internet itself is self-regulating. The, the non-living components of the internet are self-regulating through the protocols and the functions that, that um, enable the protocols to know what the hell they're doing. And the AIs are, are getting to be model-based. They can do model-based reasoning. And the models are built out of functions. And, and so the non-living systems are getting to the point where, where they're over, overtaking humans in terms of model-based reasoning and functional management systems. Mm. And if the medium is the message, it ain't working for protocols and functions and models. Our, our brains are just for the average person, except for the engineers and a few scientists they're not catching on. That's a very, very disturbing observation. I agree. You, you see that, that um, Golden Gate Bridge behind me? Yeah. 1935, some very brilliant civil engineers figured out how to build that thing. All right. And it, it has survived. It has not you know, fallen down um, in, in a century. And so the engineers know how to build systems that uh, are structurally sound and survivable. And functional right. and know what how to maintain them how to paint them every you know they never finished painting the gold gate bridge yeah yeah um, and, and on the anniversary of it you know when they closed it to traffic and had people walking on it you see how it's bowed the day that the people were on it was flat <laughs> it, it had so much weight on it from people walking on it and i was on it that day uh, in 1975 hmm. And you can see that, you know, instead of having that sort of slide of an arc, it was actually <laughs> loaded down to where it was flat, but it didn't fail. It didn't fail, yeah. Could have, but they knew, they knew how to, you know, how many people could be on it and it wouldn't overload it and fail. They built one in London that when the people walked across, it was a footbridge and it started swaying. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Got into res they, it went into resonance. And the, the people who understood resonance, the mathematicians who could figure out resonance, understood why it went into resonance and how to fix it and how to limit the number of people on it so that it wouldn't go into resonance. Right. And why when the military walks across the bridge, they have to break stride and not march. Yeah, that's right. They have, to go, they have to go into chaotic footfalls so that they don't go into resonance. Right. 
So there are people who know, know the math and know the engineering, but they're 1% of the population, if that, one-tenth of 1% 1 of the population. Well, we are saying that in the, the spot can destroy a jungle, right? <laughs> a forest, right? So yeah. the question is, you know, as long as the spark is is ready and the, the the dryness is ready for the spark and you know it will be so when you know it's almost like when the when the when the student is ready the teacher is there waiting for them or something along that same line the the environmental engineers at exxon 50 years ago exactly modeled and exactly predicted the global warming that's happening right now they had it to within a fraction of a percent of the model, correct model in terms of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And they had the, they had the correct model, the excellent engineers for fossil fuels. They, and they wrote, then they wrote that up for the, for the management and the management of Exxon sealed it and, and told the public the opposite. They ignored the people who knew what they were talking about. It's all about money. They wanted to keep on selling fossil fuels and they didn't want to say, we're on a road to disaster. So you had the profits, the engineers, the, the model-based reason, you know, the scientists, they, they, all, they had it all worked out. One-tenth of 1% 1 of the employees of Exxon knew what was going to happen and they said so. Well, but it's not, not important for him to go to public and publish it himself because he will be good to jail for that or something like that. What, what you find, especially in the military, but also in the government in general, is that the people who are on the inside know what's happening and they have to wait until they retire right. so that they can't lose their job. Right. And then they tell the truth after they've retired. Right. But and, then and, it's some, great. and sometimes they tell the truth by writing a novel in which the truth is embedded, embedded in this work of in this allegory. Right. And so first they'll write an allegory and then they'll come out and just tell the plain truth in plain English after they're on their deathbed. Copernicus yeah. waited until he died. He says, Here, here's a model, here's a mathematical model of the solar system, but don't publish until I'm dead. Here's the book, keep this book a secret. And when I'm dead, let the book out. How can we change that? So far we haven't been able to. Galileo made the mistake of blabbing Copernicus's model while, while Galileo was still alive. He got the telescope, he looked at Jupiter, he saw the miniature solar system of Jupiter, worked out the orbits of the four visible moons, the Galilean moons, and he told the story. Now he, he, wrote, he wrote an allegory. He wrote a story with three characters in it about the solar system. And, and Pope Urban got wind of it and realized that it was mocking the Pope, Simplicio was the Pope, and they hauled him before the tribunal and they told him to shut the fuck up and not ever and and deny, you know, this model of the solar system that is based on an example of the Copernican model. So here's Galileo, by the way, he's a redhead. <laughs> so red survival. Redheads have this have this tendency of telling the truth and then getting getting the shit kicked out of them. Darwin yeah. was a redhead, by the way. Darwin yeah. told you about evolution; they should kick the shit out of him. Now, if he, if the Pope allowed him to tell the truth, what would happen to this whole chaotic that he created, or something? Now, what would happen is is that the Church had adopted the model of Aristotle. Okay, and that model was incorrect. The earth was the center of the universe uh, and the sun went around the earth. And that was the Copernican model, which is from really from Ptolemy. Aristotle adopted the Ptolemaic model. And Copernicus and Galileo realized that was a blunder. It was incorrect. It was a, it was a lie. But the church was promoting this Aristotelian model. And so basically they were going to undermine the power of the church. The church was basically going to lose credibility because they were going to be shown to be liars. Right. And so the church says we have to preserve our power. You know, shut the fuck up, Galileo. So basically, church survival is at stake. Yep. People in power. Look at Trump. Trump's in power. He loses the election. He wants to stay in power. So he's going to corrupt the whole system for the 
transition of government to the next elected leader, he tries to corrupt the whole system. Trump does basically what Paul Bourbon was doing, which is trying to shut down the advance of correct information, promote the lie, and shut down the people who are telling the truth. And the people that are helping him to do that. Yeah. And look at the people, because they want to stay in power. They want to be autocrats in power whose made up stories are governing our species. And then there's a few percent of our species who know that this is baloney. Carl Sagan knows it's baloney. He says so. But how many people pay attention to Carl Sagan? Or Neil deGrasse Tyson says so. How many people? And Neil deGrasse Tyson and Carl Sagan are basically, you know, one is the descendant of the other. Neil deGrasse Tyson takes over where Sagan leaves off with Cosmos and being a, a spokesperson on, on behalf of, of science. There's okay. something that we can do to help. Uh, look, look, you and I are nowhere near as talented as Isaac Asimov or Carl Sagan or Neil deGrasse Tyson or any of these very articulate spokespeople for science and engineering. And, and we see the same thing that Sagan saw, that Neil deGrasse Tyson, we see it. We can, I can write about it on, on my blog or on Facebook. I can say the same thing in the language of mathematics. I'm not so good at saying it in the language of poetry. But I'm not, a, I'm not a very we good. We have a tool that allows us to do that now. So that's yeah. the problem. But the point is, is that people have, I mean, Aesop wrote morality plays for children. Shakespeare writes plays that are tragedies and comedies. I mean, people who, uh, Homer writes stories. Dostoevsky writes a fabulous pair of novels on, on the uh, absurdity of, of the rule of law. I mean, people who are gifted writers who can write novels. J.K. Rowling writes a fabulous series um, on good and evil. And he, she has uh, Hermione Granger Realize that in order to solve the problem, they're going to have to break every rule in the book. That's a major transition apostasy where she throws away being uh, allegiance to the rules. They're going to have to break every rule if they're going to survive. Lots and lots of literature. Neil Gaiman writes these great series on Netflix. A lot, there are lots of lots of very you know, beautifully written pieces of literature and poetry and dramatic series. They did that series, Don't Look Up, which is about the asteroid. It's a comedy, but it's really about global warming. It's just, it was just, it was just an allegory where instead of global warming, they made it an asteroid. And, and uh, Leo DiCaprio, who played the scientist, modeled his, his character after the real scientist who's, who does global warming. When the real scientist who did the real global warming he and his daughter watch the premiere of the movie. His daughter says, Leo DiCaprio is playing you, daddy. And he realized, yeah, Leo DiCaprio basically adopted the mannerisms of the, of the global warming scientist. And they, they chose to do it with an asteroid because that's an event, which has a, it's gonna happen on a given day. Whereas global warming is this gradual thing where you're, you're gradually going over the cliff. And so they, they, they switched it to a different, a different calamity. That was the same story. Yeah. That's what I was talking about yesterday. You have the facts and they got sugar coated it. Right, exactly. You, you, you take the true story, which is technical right. and arcane and mathematical, and you map it over to something that Aesop Acceptable. can explain to a child yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with funky little animal rabbits and squirrels and whatever. And uh, you tell the story as if you're talking to a third grader, yeah, like like you wanted to do, right. and 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 the third grader gets the story and understands the story, and the Lorax is a spokesperson for environmental awareness. And Dr. Seuss has the Lorax, there, and every kid reads the Lorax or the Grinch or whatever and gets the whole story, and nothing changes. I think I call it planting a seed. I call yeah. it planting a seed. They do plant the seed. And nothing changes because the seed is not, you know, just like a redwood tree. The seed is smaller than the sesame seed, right? 
it takes years to, to have a sprout. Jesus talks about a mustard seed. He takes the mustard is the tiny yes, thing yeah. that people can recognize as a seed. Talks about the mustard seed. Yeah. And he, and you have to plant it on fertile soil, not on barren soil. Right. So I mean, the systems thinkers have been around, you know, since biblical times. So, you know, they 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 see this. And they have tried every medium of communication imaginable, from theology to classic literature to opera to Greek theater, you know, to mm -hmm. modern movies. Um, th th they've used every medium, you know, that they could harness to tell these stories for millennia. Yeah. And I look, you and I look at it and go, how are we going to do what they didn't do? Mm -hmm. they, they've used every medium imaginable and we have learned we have we can learn from them right they said we also the, everything is is at an exponential speed right now that we can learn that we are the powerful the tools are very powerful that we have in our hands right now two things that we have that they didn't have we have the technology of the internet itself that's right and the technology of art of computers and and ai right the question is can can the internet and computers and AI achieve what humans haven't been able to achieve through our medium of communication? Right. And the answer is probably not. We've had the internet for well, not fifty years because the first versions of it. Were I, I, I disagree with that. Probably not. Uh, see, let me give you the, the strategy. I'm the eldest son of the, a family of eight sibling, right? So. The way that I deal with all the problems that my family has is that I let them try everything they try. Let's say they try 99 times. So I would make sure they explain to me what the, they have tried 99 times. Then I just suggest a hundred times, whatever the hundred option, whatever you call it, the, the 100 new version, the, the only one new version they haven't tried yet. The, the innovation that they didn't have any familiar, familiar, yeah. familiarity with. And the internet involved a lot of innovations. Yeah cybernetic systems theory and protocols yeah. all that stuff and the geniuses who developed that in the 1960s and 70s i think a lot of them have probably died by now yeah, of course um and and they've left this legacy of the technology systems the automated systems in in communication and transportation and, and information systems the the telephone network's almost entirely automated now yeah yeah you pick up a phone and make a call there's not an operator in the loop that's right yeah, there may be a there may be a, a technician who's keeping the system repaired when it breaks, but they're not in the loop for individual phone calls anymore. That's right. That's right. So the system is 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 self perpetuating, self maintaining, um, self reporting when it needs attention, mm -hmm. and increasingly able to design its next generation. Right. Uh, CPUs. The, the, the current CPU is used to design the next generation of CPUs. Right. Humans couldn't design CPUs after a few generations. The, the CPU itself had to design its next iteration. That's right. That's right. I mean, looking at the three micron lab is being built right now in Taiwan, right? Three yeah. micron, right? So from my perspective, again, I'm going back to say it's not impossible. It's just say now we have more tools. We have now a better option. That's all it is. Yeah. And we're building chips that are going to use photons instead of electrons. That's right. Um, so there's a photonics instead of uh, electronics. And, right. and, and um, Boolean gates may be giving away to analog gates. Right. In some systems, which are analog instead of Boolean. So, yeah. It, so we have better tools. We are better equipped with historical data. We understand all that. So we have a good, better chance Maybe the chance be one in a million. We may not succeed, but hell, we have much better tool than they had. But fewer and fewer humans in the loop because there are fewer and fewer humans who are managing these high tech systems, these intelligent high tech systems, and so the rest of us are kind of sitting back and watching this unfold, without being the labor that's making it happen. We're maybe we're still building the factories. But the design of the factories is is becoming increasingly sophisticated. I mean, somebody has to. But the thing is, you have to remember something. Okay, so if let's say I'm coaching someone how to run on Olympics, right? 
it's not that I run faster than this person. It's just that I can see a perspective that they don't see that I can correct them to fix it, whatever it is. So as an observer or holding thing in place, we have a different position. We have a different role to help them. The, the, the football coach takes a video of the, of the athlete and right. says, watch this video of you performing this maneuver and look at the detail of where you could have slightly improved how you threw the football. That's how right. You Football, how right. you blocked and tackled. That's right. And so they're using technology to see finer and finer detail that can That's be right. up to the point of how much control do we have over our own bodies? Because at this right. point, mm -hmm. how how precise can you throw a football so it lands exactly in the hands of the receiver and right. not get intercepted? All right. At some point you run out of precision. The 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 thing that can throw the basketball at the basket, the the art the automated arm. Right. Can make it can can hit the basket every time. A yeah, human course. can do a free throw. Yeah, the limit, you know, ninety percent. Yeah. So what I call this is that you know we need every, every all hands on deck or whatever you call that features, right? So all hands on deck. We as long as everybody have the same intention to survive and survive right. it better for the future. Then we get a, what I found. I think I saw a video the other day is that people are so focused on the immediate gratification instead of the long term. Yeah, right. that's the biggest problem. Yeah. And so we eat Cheetos and, and salted uh, pickles or whatever. I, <laughs> we're, we, we are falling into the regime where we're consumers and we're leaving the production to yeah. fewer and fewer smarter and smarter entities. Increasingly, more of them are not even living systems. Yeah. They're, they're automated systems. Yeah. Uh, so, it, how's it going to play out? The prof, you know, the prophets like uh, um, what's his the, or forgetting his name, um, the guy who does collapse of civilization. He says we're getting closer and closer to the pattern of the collapse of civilization. You know, we're not managing the ecosystem. We're not managing the environment. We're not managing our governmental systems. Our governmental systems are going off the rails. You know, our use of energy systems is is uh, un, not properly managed. And a lot of people say, you know, the whole thing's going to, we're on the road to collapse. In some way, also going back to your learning presentation is that we have to go through an unlearning and make some right. correction before we can make of major improvements. So the correction is imminent. The uh, right. correction is, is needed. At the same time, is that we are so blind to the correction that we ignore the correction and we snowballing the correction. We get stuck in this correction cycle. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're talking about the Big Bang the other day. Why is it called the Big Bang? And I said, you know, if I were there when they named it, I would have called it the big becoming, or as opposed to the bang, because because it, it was a whole process of becoming that's evolved over fourteen billion years. And if you look at the dawn of human civilization in the last six thousand years, I would call that the big blundering, because when we invented civilization, we blundered big time. And some people, like Augustine, gave it the, a name: original sin. That we blundered at the dawn of civilization, we made some stupid mistakes. And some people called it, you know, Adam's fall or original sin. I said it was just a math error. We just built a regulatory mechanism that was idiotic. Hmm. Um, and when we figured out it was idiotic, we didn't fix it. We kept we kept on repeating the same blunder forever. We never we never fixed the stupid mistakes. But when you're in it, you can see that. You can only see when, you, when you're when far from it, when you're thousands of years later. So Augustine, by the way, he was a redhead. <laughs> Augustine, by the way, when he was a, an adolescent, he was out of control. He was into boozing and, and women. He was a really, he was, he was a juvenile delinquent. But when he grew up, when he became an adult, he, he reconsidered his behavior as a youngster and went on to become a, a deep thinker, a deep theological thinker. And he says, you know, just as, a, just as he had made stupid mistakes, idiotic mistakes as, as a youth, he says, when humans were at the youthful adolescent stage of Western civilization, they also made stupid mistakes. 
and he could see them. Yeah. And he could say, we blundered 6,000 years ago, and it, he called it original sin, which is just missing the mark. And I said, yeah, we invented the rule of law and, and ownership and, and uh, commerce and trade. And, and we made a lot of stupid art, architectural mistakes. And it's, a, it's an unstable system. And people who were deep thinkers could see that. And the theologians tried to fix it. You know, the, the founders of the great religions, you know, Moses, Buddha, Jesus, Lao Tzu, you know, others like them came along and said, let's, let's correct these idiotic mistakes that we made six to five, 6,000 years ago. And we didn't. Yeah. We, we didn't heed them. We didn't understand, didn't heed them. Here comes Rene Girard and tells the same thing in the 20th century. How many people have heard of Rene Girard and has looked, read his stuff? Making changes is a complex, is a very loaded word. So for me, I look at myself, can I change myself? Okay, can I change my business model? Can I change my own, own behavior? So it's I, when I look at it from the perspective, okay, if I change, that means I have to give up whatever I have been doing and shifting to a new mindset, shifting to a new, um, you know, way of thinking. And there's a lot of unknown in there. And so unknown means fear, worry about survival. But I might not survive in a new way of thinking and all that stuff. So again, changes is is very demanding. It's it's fearful. It's scary. It's death. You know. I can't figure out. I know that what I'm doing isn't working. <laughs> As a science educator, I know that we're not doing a very good job of science education. So I know that I'm not doing something that would that would be working. Right. I don't have a clue how to evolve to something that is working because everything I've thought of and tried and other people thought of and tried haven't worked. Right. I look at Carl Sagan, I look at Neil deGrasse Tyson and others like them. And I go, they're doing a fabulous job, but it's not working. And they're a hell of a lot better at it than I've ever been. Right. What the hell? What the hell can I think of doing that they aren't already doing better than anybody on the planet? Mm. Well, the way I believe is that if we keep trying and keep at it, one day we'll find a way. So this is what I call enlightened, right? Or we go extinct. You go we'll extinct. Find a way we go extinct. And and I looked at it and it says, when I was a teenager, I says, I'm not going to bring any more children to this world until we figure this out. Right. Never figured it out. It got worse and worse from from the 1960s when I was a teenager until now. Things have degraded. They have gotten any better. And I never did bring any children in the world because I thought I I can't guarantee that they're going to have a future. They're going to have a world to live in that's worth you know that's good enough. And I worry about my brother's grandchildren. My brother has grandchildren who are going to inherit the stupid legacy we're leaving them. And I, I go, how are they ever going to solve this? They're, they're not dumb. They're really smart kids. But they're up against a problem that nobody knows how to solve. Are they going to look back in 30 years on their parents and, and their grandparents, my generation, and say, what the hell did you leave us to live through? Yeah. And, and the answer is, I, I think we blundered. I think, we, we think we're part of the big blundering. Yeah. And fix it. Yeah. We perpetuated the stupid blunders that our ancestors made five, six thousand years ago. Yeah. You reminds me of after I got married, take me five solid years to think about it, to talk to so many people, read so many books. And finally I have take a leaf of faith. <laughs> I want to have been have the experience of being a parent. That's the leaf of faith. I had the experience of being a parent, not a biological parent, but a mimetic parent. Right. I went into science education and public education, and I helped educate a lot of children, but they weren't biological children. They didn't have my DNA. Yeah. Uh, but they had, you know, I wanted to pass along the means, you know, systems thinking and mathematics, you know, big scientific reasoning, model-based reasoning. And I got known as, you know, the science educator who introduced model-based reasoning to people who never heard of it. When I retired, and the guy at Fidelity, you know, took my intake and he said, what was your profession? I said, I was a systems thinker. He says, I, I've never heard of systems theory. What the hell is that? I'm, I've been taking an intake of new retirees for 40 years. He says, you're the first person who, who told me that a profession was systems thinking. What the hell is that? Never heard of it. Yeah.
Yeah. How are we doing on time? You got 20 more minutes. If 40 minutes to, to yeah. second hour. Let's Why don't you talk, this up? talk about something, something less depressing? <laughs> no, it's not. I, I, I don't look at it as depressing. I look at it as we are where we are today because of the decision we have made so far. Right? So I'm responsible to create whatever I created today, talking to you and as well as, you know, Sam and all that stuff. So from my perspective, it's nothing good, nothing bad. It just is. I mean, I I think that the, the place where we fell down was the power of story craft. When we went into education, we kind of threw away the story craft version and went into the more uh, nonfiction presentation of knowledge, which I think wasn't such a bad idea. We needed to learn some mathematics and 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 scientific and experimental work and fact-based reasoning. But it turns out that we lost the the power of story craft. So I never learned to make stories to explain things. Now Neil deGrasse Tyson is pretty good at it. He he can come up with a metaphor uh, or an analogy that's got a got a little bit of poetry in it. And my analogies were technical analogies. They were story craft analogies. And and so I think the, I think in the 21st century we got we have to learn how to harness and exploit the power of storycraft. But I don't know how to make a story that works. I mean, we tried it with ChatGPT, make fairy yeah. tales. Right, right, right. And 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 here's ChatGPT come along and make a story that's yeah. designed to for a third grader. Mm -hmm. I look at it and go, well, I couldn't have done that. The next question is, is it any good? Does it actually work? Yeah. I look at the bigger picture, if I may. It's not a story curve. The way that, you know, remember what I said earlier is that the meaning of communication is the response we receive. What do I need to do, story curve or otherwise? How could I deliver the package that they can accept and it is digestible and also allow them to take a leap of faith to change the behavior, whatever that changes there may be. So unless I can give them a package where I give them, you know, that entice them to, to have a compelling reason to shift you know, how do you move so, the whole? So do you have a model of a new medium, a new packaged medium that is better and more functional, more effective than all the media, all the packaging we've tried from the dawn of civilization to date? Right. What do you have in mind that we haven't tried yet? Well, I'm looking at from the perspective of TikTok, right? So right now, the most potent, dramatically impactful <laughs> medium right now is TikTok. Short video. Have you been to TikTok? I, I have I don't have an account on TikTok. I no, think... you don't have to have an account. You can just watch it on YouTube. Can you? Uh, what are people doing on TikTok that's innovative and functional beyond what people are doing, say on commercials? You you watch the commercials on TV. Commercials are very creative and very innovative and they're using CGI and all kinds of clever uh, ideas for, for advertising. What are people doing on TikTok that's beyond that? Let me let me give you a, a couple of layers down to at a deeper level of the TikToks. Number one, TikToks have algorithm that see what you like. So for example, let's say you look, you just look at pretty girls. The TikTok will give you a series of all the pretty girls video for you, like 30 seconds, 20 seconds, 20, 10 seconds of pretty girls or something. So let's say you love science, okay, physics. So it will give you all the physics video that people can give it to you, short video. Now that's one characteristic of TikTok. The second characteristic of TikTok is that because you're we watching physics, so your mind's in the physics structure mentality, or whatever. It is. So the next physics video coming out will be a lot easier for you to absorb. Instead of like one was about cooking and the other one's about physics, it's much harder to shift, right? Law of inertia, right? So I call it habitual momentum and the thinking momentum. So you're in the trend of learning physics. Okay, so that's that. The third thing about this is that TikTok is, is buying. So, so let's say I watch a physics video for 30 seconds, but I stop at 10 seconds, which means that I don't like the video. The TikTok pick that up and say, well, it's too complicated or whatever. So the only the one that I will watch all the way to 30 seconds, they say, well, that's great video. So then they get a high ranking. So they will get, they'll be in the storefront, you know. So when you walk in, you can miss them or whatever you call that, right? So that's that. The next thing is that 
TikTok has, because of the competitiveness, had created a lot of reward to pay for the people that create this video. Guess what happened? So people will do their best to combine all the things. So, so for example, I want to learn about physics, about something, uh, let's say, you know, something very complicated to understand. The, 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 your ability, the, the creator, the, uh, your ability to make it very simple so that in 30 seconds, we'll understand the concept, it takes me two years to understand. You know, so there's a lot of very highly condensed, highly, what they call generalization, make people understand it. So that's the TikTok phenomenon, which means that you can learn a whole book in 30 seconds, that kind of uh, high, highly condensed, easy to understand, ease of use while you're in the train of learning all that stuff. So I would suggest that watch some TikTok video. They also created tools that allow you to create a video for you. So which means that for example, they give you the publisher version of TikTok that you can create a video and it will walk you through it, all that stuff. So I'm looking at all that again. It's one of those things that I'm looking for the topics. And once I have the topics, I can I can do something about okay, here this is where I need to put them all in it to the to stop the sound or whatever the door noise or whatever you call that. So Again, it's about the platform, what is most successful out there, how can I model them, how can I use jam on the bandwagon with them, and the, once I have the right topic I can put on them, that would be the, the best way to go about doing it because they have the most efficient vehicle to communicate, and they have the right model to do that. But they're not doing the creative work. Other people, other people are competing to generate content that rises to the top. No, traffic wise, bandwidth wise, nobody come close to number two on TikTok. Take a look at how many hits TikTok is getting. It's neck to neck with Google. <laughs> but the point is, is that art, is the general population becoming enlightened as a result of content on TikTok, or are they simply becoming entertained and addicted to, to entertainment that has no nutritional value? I agree. I agree with you. But remember, one thing is that once you understand something that you didn't understand before, Barry, you will never go back to your old way of thinking anymore. Well, so what I worry about is becoming addicted to entertaining content that distracts me from the problem of how to survive. You cannot worry about addiction because it's a totally different problem altogether. So what I'm saying, go back to this, was Chevron, the engineer about global warming? Exxon. Exxon, okay. So Exxon's engineer, if we will review the facts that you read the book, you watched the video, you now have a total different concept in your mind that you have gone through this next level of thinking that you will never go back. So that realization for me to enlighten people, or you want to call that the wake them up. Once they are awake, they can never go back to sleep. Yeah. And so what happens is, is you begin to worry and become distressed and depressed that you can now see that we're heading off the edge of the cliff and there's no way to steer this. I understand. Let me repeat myself. Worrying about this sidetrack, it will be a distraction for us. So I'll, let me put it this way, okay? So would the engineer of this engineer about global warming worry about people get sidetracked from his book publishing or the video, I mean, the, the movies? Well, I heard a guy on the radio this morning. He was, he was on one of the Sunday morning public radio shows. And he was the, he was the guy who, who Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio was emulating in that don't look up, even though right. it was technically a different problem. But he was talking about the fact that, you know, he and others have been trying to figure out for 50 years how to, how to turn around humankind so we, right. don't, we don't create an unlivable system. Right. And he appreciated the fact that Leonardo DiCaprio and others had made this movie, Don't Look Up, Mm -hmm. which, which try to reach more people. But at the end of the day, the point was, we're going to get to three degrees 
increase in, in atmospheric temperature sometime probably in this century. And as a result, the environment's gonna change and become unlivable for his grandchildren. Yeah. And, and he doesn't see any way to stop that from happening despite all the best efforts for 50 years of trying to get this message out to the general public. And he, he talks about trying to, trying to not become depressed or so angry that he has a meltdown on public television. And, and the point was is that Leonardo DiCaprio's character in the story has a meltdown on public television. He becomes so distraught, the Leonardo DiCaprio character in the movie has a total meltdown in an interview on public television. And, and, the, and the host of this show this morning says to, to the real guy, he says, do you, ha, have you ever come close to a meltdown or do you worry about it? And he says, thank God I haven't had one, but I, I get the point that we get so distraught and so frustrated that nobody's paying attention that we have a meltdown. That's right. Which maybe is what's going to be necessary. It's, it's like that movie, Greed is Good. Remember that movie where the, the newscaster yeah, right. has a meltdown? I can't remember the story. The newscaster has his meltdown uh, on the newscast. And the point is, is that maybe that's what it's going to take to wake people up. If Tom Brokaw had a meltdown <laughs> before he retired, you know, may, maybe people would have would have paid attention. Let me see if I can say things in a differently. So have you ever heard a story that engineer that know how to fix car is a terrible owner of the car repair shop? <laughs> because the skill that he has is a fixed car. He's terrible in running the business. Right. So he's, he's an engineer. He know how to do the simulation all that. He's not a problem solver on global warming, for God's sake. So that's, that's, that, that's William Shockley, who supervised the two people who literally invented the transistor. He went back to California to start a company, the Shockley Transistor Company, to market the transistor. And he was a terrible manager of a business. That's he right. Okay, as a supervisor of two people at Bell Labs, That's right. he couldn't supervise, he couldn't manage, become the CEO of a company to manufacture and sell transistors. So my, my point to you is that if an engineer say that, I don't see how this market can be profitable. I say, I'm going to discredit you, my friend, engineer, because you're not qualified to say that statement. So don't tell me that you don't see a way out and you have a bell that it has nothing, no meaning to me whatsoever, because you're not qualified to say that statement. Yeah. So what I'm, my point to you is this, you, you did your job in discovering these facts and you need to share them to the world so that the collective consciousness, the collective wisdom will be able to solve this problem together as, as one. It's not depending on you only. Don't don't put all the egoistic thought that unless I can solve it, nobody can solve it. It's, it's a little bit like Jane Wagner and Lily Tomlin. Jane Wagner wrote all the material that Lily Tomlin presented in her comedic presentation. Lily Tomlin basically didn't create hardly any of her own material, but she enacted it. And she was literally married. I mean, they were, they were life partners. And you, you know about Lily Tomlin because you've seen her do all these characters. And you may, if you're paying attention, have heard of Jane Wagner, who was the author of that material. And what, what I need is somebody like Anne Marie who can enact the material that I present. I mean, she also was, was a, a scholar of systems theory, but not at the mathematical depth that I went into. Right. She was more at the presentation level. And, and what I would like to see is somebody like Anne Marie use her presentation skills to figure out a better way of presenting the material than I've been able to present using my academic, scholarly, mathematical uh, medium. I, I'm one more better. Don't look for one person. Look for a tool, a person, a efficiency, any, a system, uh, whatever. I just give you that future tools website that you can now do a storytelling with the tools and you can get direct feedback from it without no, no, nobody to convince and nobody to work on it for you because you have the 
you know, if you can do the driving, it's better than be a second driver. So I'm saying, don't be a second driver. So it's hard to get to work with a person to so that they dedicate their time and their resources with you. A tool is the best solution to anything that I want to do. So I, yesterday, I spent like six hours on trying to understand a concept I could never, I never have an opportunity to learn how to understand the concept. I took six hours to use AI tool every which way I can ask a, do the prompt engineer you and I are very familiar with and use a prompt engineer to grab out of the tool if I need to pay for the tool for you to, to be able to like a, another person that can do that what you needed I'll be glad to do that for you no question about it you know in Boston they have the drivers who drive the buses and and the subways yeah. and commuter rails and and they're very good drivers. That's what yep, they do. Of course. There, there's a tour company that has the Boston duck boats. I don't want to know what about the duck boats. The duck boats are these amphibious, amphibious vehicles. Okay. I think I know. Yeah. I think, and I think the so. drivers who take people on the tours, yes, they can drive the boats, but they're entertainers. Yeah. They're funny as hell. And as they drive around Boston and point out the sites, they are hilarious presenters. Right. And hired not for their driving skills. Right. Well, driving a duck boat is tricky because you also take it on the water. Right. You actually actually go down a ramp and you take it in on the Charles River right. uh, for a spin in the water. So they actually have to know how to drive the duck boat, but they're hired because they are hilarious right. presenters of the tour. And and I don't have that skill. <laughs> Again, now you have autopilot driving vehicle that you don't need to have that skill is what I keep reminding you. Find a driver that, find a driverless vehicle that you can use, that te- you trust in technology and use that technology to help it while you do your... So, what, so what, can, you can Chat GPT or Bard take over writing my comic operas, my song parodies, my blog posts? Yeah. My, can they write, can they write the, the material on my behalf Right. That is a bigger audience than I ever could reach with my style of presentation. We tried that already. A five-year-old. Uh, yeah. So, so what's the answer? How many people got more out of the ChatGPT version and re- and responded to? It? How many people responded to the ChatGPT? No, version? that's not a fair question. That's not a fair question. You need to have the bigger feedback loop. Okay. Let me start with this. The meaning of communication is the response you get. Okay, the meaning of the chat GDP, what the, well, the result of the chat, GDP, the resulting writing from the chat GDP is not the result of the chat GDP. It's the way that you prompted it. If you have a terrible prompter, the chat GDP will give you a terrible result. So you need to fine tune your prompting technology so that chat GDP will give you exactly what you need. Well, what I need is for people to become enlightened how do you know that how do i know they become because if they're unenlightened they're going to be doing stupid things they're going to continue the blundering how do you measure that i don't know how to measure okay if you don't know how to measure that how could you have chat gp to do that for you the the thing is is that whatever i write on social networks or blogs or whatever i have no way to know whether that made a difference yeah i don't, that's a, I, don't I don't have a control group that's right control so, group. So my point is that the, 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 <laughs> the enlightenment is too big of a chunk. Just go down to say, if they give you a light, it's like they check with a heart, put a heart there, it's like, oh, that's a that's a five star. If they give you a light, there's like a two star feedback. Here's what I'll tell you. When I post a photograph of my brother's grandchildren, right. when I went to Indianapolis for a week one summer, and right. went, my brother and I took the grandchildren to the zoo and, and to the museum, and we had photographs of the kids in the museum and in the zoo, people l- liked those photographs. Yeah. They but they had, but those photographs, w- w- all they saw is that my brother and I were taking the grandchildren, you know, to outings. That's right. You oh, know why? Why do you know why? I do you tell me. Yeah. If you don't know why, that's no feedback for you. So you never learn from the photograph posting. I'm not I, telling you something, I'm just telling you. I'm trying to give you feedback on the feedback. All I know is if I do academic material, three people will read it and, and say, I liked it. So how could, I, how could you do the academic presentation in photograph and see how the presentation will give you feedback? Well, 
the one thing I know is that if you have a four-year-old child explaining oxytocin poorly, <laughs> people will love it. Now, whether they'll understand what the child is simply reciting, there was one just yesterday. Somebody posted a, a four-year-old child trying to explain oxytocin. Right. Okay. And I had to watch it two or three times to even figure out what the words were. Right. I couldn't make out the words. Okay. Right. But it would turn out to be oxytocin. Right. And people loved it, right. even though they probably didn't learn anything about oxytocin, but right. they loved this kid That's talking, right. trying to explain oxytocin. Right. And it was cute. Yeah. Did they learn anything? I don't know. Did they, they, learn, they learned that a four year old can explain this in such a way that it makes them laugh. Makes them laugh. But the point is, did, did, did the kid understand oxytocin, really? It's not important. Again, it's, it's, again you are, the focus is to get them people to read your stuff. The focus is not for them to understand and, anything. And by, the, and by the way, the person who posted the video, her name is Riho Mohan Duzak or something like that. Have you, do you know what I'm talking about? Probably not. I didn't, I didn't see that one. She is a knockout. She's probably the most fabulous, beautiful person. She's an absolute knockout. All right. Nice. She can post a picture of her drive, sitting in front of her car. And yeah. it'll get a ton of likes because she's gorgeous. Yeah. See? She's also this pretty smart. So you can use AI to create a knockout of version of Barry we call it Harry. <laughs> well, you know, the presentation. Look, look at the people who, who went to the Barbenheimer movies, the Barbie and Oppenheimer movies. Right. And most people liked the Barbie movie better than the Oppenheimer movie. The Oppenheimer right. movie is about atomic energy. And right. the music is, movie is about a doll, plastic. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and they love the performance of the guy who plays Ken. They love the performance of the female who played Barbie. And what did they learn from Barbenheimer? I, I, I'm pretty sure they didn't learn very much about atomic bomb. Let me, let me switch it a little bit. When you eat, do you order something that's yummy or do you order something that's nutritious for you? I, I eat right here in the kitchen. <laughs> I know, but do you eat Things that taste yummy to you, or do you eat something that you know the doctor say this is I need to eat, I need this nutrition? I basically eat what I can know how to make that is a balanced meal and is not something you get in a fancy restaurant. You know, notice the word they use balance. That's a skip, that's that's a giveaway, right? I ask myself, am I getting protein? Am I getting uh the minerals from vegetables, vitamins? Am I getting uh, the vitamin C. Basically, I'm saying, am I getting a balanced meal? Because I know that if I don't get a balanced meal, my health is going to go to hell in a hand. But if it's hot to eat or doesn't taste good, do you eat it? It's my question. Oh, I, I basically, first of all, <laughs> this is important. In my family, we have a terrible sense of smell. My father in his later years could not enjoy his food because all he got was the, the texture of the food. Eating right. the aroma. And so when I eat food, even if I eat food that supposedly has a good aroma, I don't get the aroma. Okay. I can get the salt and I can get the, uh, uh, you know, salt, what is it called? Salt, sweet, bitter. Mm -hmm. I can get the taste, but it's not a big deal. And I don't get much in the way of aroma. So I eat, I eat to live. I don't live to eat. It's, it's, not, it's not something I do for the pleasure I do something because if I don't eat, <laughs> okay. No, so let's try this. Let's try this. When you go to a store, the both of them have a, both products on the shelf has the same ingredient. How do you pick which one or the other? I buy the store brand because it's the same ingredients and it's half the price. Yeah, it's still, so so see you have your criteria, right? Your criteria is store brand because you don't need the taste. But for most people, I, for most people, let me actually remind you, they would pick the one that tastes better. I buy. I buy. V8 vegetable juice, but not necessarily the brand V8. If the if the store brand is available, I buy the store brand. Often it's not, so I have to buy the expensive brand, the you know, the name brand. Right. Why do I buy V8? Because it's easier to drink the vegetables than to cook the vegetables. So right. I know I need vegetables because right. I need the ingredients, but I'll buy V8 or the store brand version of V8 because I'm 
it's easier to drink V8 than to cut up the carrots and cut up the peas and, you know, cook the right. vegetables you know, or the, buy the full frozen. Now, I'll buy corn in a can because right. the V8 doesn't have corn in it. Right. But I won't buy corn on the cob because corn on the cob is 50 cents a, a, a cob and I can, 50 cents, I can get a whole can of corn. Right. So, so when some a nutritionist comes to tell you that corn is best to eat it from the cup where it's fresh and it's nutrition and no preservative on it, but you will not change it because it's not convenient for you. It's only available for one or two months in the summer. And even then, most of the time, it's a dollar a cob. And once when it's on sale, it might be 30 cents or 50 cents a cob for one, for one week. All right. And the rest of the week, it's either not available or it's ridiculously That's expensive. right. That's right. And it, See, the question, the point I'm trying to make is that you're stuck with whatever you do and you continue to do it and you wouldn't change it because of some other reason that they have. So when they're in season, would you buy the fresh cup? The fresh which? The, when you, when the, the cup, when the corn is in season, do you buy the fresh one? I used to, I used to buy corn on the cob routinely in the summer, but for the last three years, it either wasn't available at all or it was ridiculously expensive and didn't look very good. I, I basically haven't bought corn on the cob for about four years now. So, so the, if I may suggest to you so that we can leave this call here is that if you pay attention to how you eat and how you decide what food to put in your stomach is how people digest the material you're putting to them. Yeah. You have the best material, you have the best ingredient, you have the freshest, the, the, the best of the freshest ingredient, but people are not buying them because the way that you buy them is the way you buy them. Yeah. I mean, I try to write fresh ideas. So I write a post an idea. It's not a war, you know, old warmed over idea. I try to ideas that are innovative and interesting and current and people haven't thought about them, but that doesn't mean that they get anything out of them. That's right. And I try to be succinct. I try to write extremely succinct. So a very few sentences that say a lot on mm -hmm. ideas that people probably haven't thought about that's worth thinking about that's how i write yeah i love your writing and that's one i I'm, one thing i fell in love with you is because of your writing the way you you are so you, you give a lot of attention and you really mean you know you really do your very best i would say that i cannot find a second person that write the same material as you as better than you can write it so you, you do pay a lot of attention and you do you optimize the the delivery is what I'm saying. So it, I appreciate that very, very much, really. And uh, you know, like I say, the video that you told me to watch, I watched it three times for the learning thing. I'm, I'm not kidding. I mean, I got it. You know, so this is what it is. You're unusual. I mean, you're probably one in a thousand or maybe even one in 10,000 in terms of the kind of audience that would be attracted to what I write about or talk about. And so I'm I'm committed to stuff. How how do how do we package it so that if we're in a can, well, how we'll be in the bottle of the V8 for the audience to, to, to have consumed. So feel free to play with the future tools again, and and there will be this next level up. And look at tick, look look at TikTok and watch some video video that related to your topic on the TikTok. So that will be for the week. I would say that will, you can learn a lot from the TikTok platform. And look at also to ask ChatGDP about how come TikTok is so successful and what the strategy they use. They can explain a lot of it. I'm just giving you the scratch of the surface on the, what it can do. I mean, I do look for people who I think are very good presenters, but so people like Hank Green or uh, Grant Sanderson. I mean, these people are world class. Right. I look at these world class presenters, and I go, these are world class presenters. Their orders of magnitude beyond right. my, my uh, level of ability to, to but do. at the same time you can also tell ChatGDP to write things up and create the material just like them their creation as well right you know that right I, I i have gone to people like hank green and grant sanderson and i say here is when you did your course on psychology uh hank green or when you did your course on math on calculus grant sanderson here is a module you could have included on the role of emotions in learning, which would have been an example of calculus, an example of psychology that integrates math and psychology or learning theory that you would have been fabulous at presenting. And so far, no, re no response.
Well, I'm not telling you to do it this way. I'm telling you to do it the other way. You give it the whole material to the present it, you know, chat GDP, please write it in as if you are, you know, hangering or whatever. And and how would you present it differently? Yeah. I, and I mean, that material will be the, the fake hangering's material presentation, you know, whatever you call that. So, I mean, it's not for lack of trying. It's just that I haven't found a magic formula. And yeah. I think you have to be something of a snake oil salesman. Mm. And I suck at selling snake oil. I'm good, I at, no, I, I'm good at selling snake oil, if I may. Oh, there you go. See, <laughs> my, my, my personality, my ethic is such that I won't sell snake oil. I, I sell snake oil because it's fun. It's, you see how people are so ignorant. You see people are so... Just as for the, again, the agenda is different. I'm not making sales thing or to be rich. I sales thing just for entertainment reason. For me, I do song parodies for my therapy. Right. I, I sometimes will write satire right. uh, or a comic opera, but I do it as a therapy, not right. because I expect to get an audience out of it. Right. And people are looking for fun things to read. People are talking for jokes to read and to right. make them laugh, right? I mean, I, I, I Played with one, uh, some of my posts are one liners. Some of my posts are, I, I occasionally can write a cute one liner um, and get away with it. And, you know, yeah, one liner are pretty tough because there's so much generalization in it. And sometimes people could, you know, some most is, I, I love, I have some one liner myself and they are fun to, to talk about. But at the same time, there's a lot of exception that one liner doesn't include or, you know, Pack together, whatever we call that. So I, you know, people like me, we do the best we can. Yeah. And it's not Pee Wee Herman. Yeah. It's not uh, Noah. What the hell's his name? Uh, Trevor Noah. Mm -hmm. Trevor it's Noah. Not Stephen Colbert. Right. It's not Carl Sagan. It's not Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's not Sean Carroll. Uh, you know, it. I do the best I can, and I like the people who can do better than I do. But I also wonder whether you know whether they're reaching any people any better than I am. You influence the people that they will want to be ready to be influenced by you and you have a different unique presentation material that you present that's important in, in that same form. Changing the form to a different audience, but you will never influence them the same way that the original, you know. I know, I know what people who are influenced. So, so Deborah Wondermonsaker, or however you pronounce her name, she has written blogs around keywords and phrases that she got from me. And she said so, and I know that. For example, when I introduced this very obscure word, enantiodromia, <laughs> and she picked up on enantiodromia and, and said, bingo. And then she wrote a whole blog post on it, just on enantiodromia. Right. And, and it's a wonderful word. You, Carl Jung uh, picked up on enantiodromia, he says, you start off going in some direction intentionally, and before you know it, you're going 180 degrees opposite. That's right, and that's what the word means. Mm. It, it's somebody who ends up doing the ends up doing the opposite of what they intended to do, right. and not realizing that they had made a 180 somewhere in the right. middle of the journey. Right. right. Um, so, and I thought that was a great word, and it characterizes a phenomenon that you can observe. Jung observed it. Yeah. And the dramatists of ancient Greece yeah. made up the word. Yeah. So, um, and so occasionally I will introduce a term of art that names something that's extant, something that's happened that didn't have a name, and people mm -hmm. didn't appreciate it existed because they didn't have a name to label it. Right, right. But, so but the number for the word that you just described, I think about, you know, I call it cell calibration is faulty, right? So if you try to calibrate yourself, Using your own material, using your own head, you're gonna get faulty because the, your GPS is faulty, is following what you like instead of what is really the goal is. The goal is very solid, cut and dry, right? And when you allow, how can it's what I call? How could I trust myself? It's, there's no way I can trust myself. Are you crazy? No way. An example of intentional and antiodromia. When people talk about taking advice or giving advice, I say, my advice to you is to take no advice from me, including this piece. <laughs> exactly right. So it's basic as an example of an antiodromia. That's right. Yeah. Going off to give you advice, and my advice is to take no advice, including including the advice. That's right. Giving. Yeah. That's so, what I, the, my one liner on that part is that all generalization is a lie, including this one. 
Exactly. So self defeat. So it's basically self annihilating sentences. Yeah. And and I got the notion of self annihilating sentences from Douglas Hofstadter, because he included examples of self annihilating sentences in Gertel Escher Bach, the famous book he got the got the um, Pulitzer Prize for writing. I think he got the Pulitzer Prize for it. Right. Right. Anyway, it's after, it's after two hours, two hours and 15 minutes. So we should okay, go. got it. We've done our job. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and, Thank and, you so much. And I don't think I have, I don't think I can stop the recording because let me check. What am I? I am, I am a, where is it? Tell me what I am. I'm a co host. So yeah, you can stop, and I stop the recording. I cannot stop the recording. So, so Sam, will you need to tell Sam that two hours and 15 minutes and chop it. Okay. Ciao. Okay, ciao. Thank you. Okay, Sam, two hours and 15 minutes. <laughs>